welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another edition of History Hack. Uh, It's Lockie in the house and we've got a podcast today which I think should be a movie, really. Uh, I think the story is epic. Joining me is the lovely Alina. Alina, what are we talking about? I'm excited because I've not podcasted with Lockie for a very, very long time. So this is going to prove to be interesting and he's going to make fun of me. So uh, be prepared for that one, everyone. I have a bad pronunciation. But anyway, we've got Mark Pising, who's a journalist and historian who writes for publications like The Guardian, Wired and The Economist. He's here to talk to us about his first book, N4 Down, The Hunt for the Arctic Airship Italia. Welcome, Mark. Hi, it's great to be here. I love the show, so it's amazing to actually be on it. I kind of cornered you at We Have Ways and said, right, come on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have a choice, but, it, but it's, a good, it's, good, it's a good time not to have a choice, though. So. Well, that this is sense. it. We've got all like predominantly a lot of World War Two, and like you said earlier when we were chatting, that you like that we have a spread of different types of like areas and things like that. So it's nice to not just have World War Two. Sorry to all my World War Two friends out there. However much we want to have more, Alex will kill me. So, <laughs> and Lockie, yeah. Lockie's nearly a doctor. Everyone, if you've not heard. Oh yeah, I was going to sort of keep it quiet for a bit, but thanks, Alina. <laughs> uh, yeah, thesis is in. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. Uh, radio silence. Apart from that, I'm I'm liking this topic because I mean we're in that interwar period, which is just fascinating. And you know, I wasn't, I wasn't lying when I said this should be a movie because um, what we got, we've got airships and we've got polar expedition and we've got a little dash of fascism, you know, dropped in the mix as well and. Uh, tragedy and disaster and battling the elements and all this sort of stuff. I think this is, uh, I think this is terrific. No, no, I was just saying I do too. <laughs> I can't, I, I don't think we can go wrong with a bit of fascism. That always brings out the entertainment factor, really, yeah, doesn't it? it? <laughs> Fascists at the North Pole is even better, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you know what? I'm going to force myself to ask the first question because the next one's got really complicated words in it and I'm going to embarrass myself <laughs> and I want Lockie to ask that question. So I'm going to go first with... In the 1920s, amazing 1920s, love the 1920s, we've got a race to fly to the North Pole. Mm. Why are airships playing such a big role in this? Well, that's a, that's a brilliant question. Uh, I think we, we have to think about why do people want to go to the North Pole and fly to the North Pole in the first place? Well, when you, the bizarre thing I found when I, was looking, when I was doing research for this book is when you look at maps of the Arctic in the 1920s, uh, there is always a shaded land over on the other side of the North Pole, which is which is labelled as unexplored, uh, which I never re- really took on board that that was the case. And that is an, all, all the maps in the New York Times, the kind of, kind of atlases. So it's really all about getting to the North Pole, but also going to see what was beyond it. Because for a long time, there have been myths and stories of uh, kind of warm water oceans, a lost continent, people's imagination obviously went crazy, even the entrance to the hollow earth, like you'd pop up in Antarctica, or you go and discover the other entrance in Antarctica and pop up at the North Pole. Uh, or there's just land, and with land, and again, this is the 1920s, people are thinking not just coal, but oil as well, much as they are today now, with the kind of receding, uh, kind of melting ice cap. So it's really about what was there, can we kind of take that land, seize it? Can we exploit it? Can we build an empire almost on the other side of the North Pole? And the problem with fixed wing aircraft at the time were were kind of unreliable, fairly short range. You usually had to fly them in kind of brutal conditions, uh, kind of with open air cockpits. If you, if you can imagine flying over an, over the Arctic in an open air cockpit, I mean the conditions were awful. Uh, we'll come on to later about issues of navigation, but you had to keep. If you wanted to say to you got to the North Pole, you had to keep a really good record of of, of your flight and your route and your distances and your times, and that's really hard to do in a moving plane 
open top plane in the Arctic with all the noise and all the chaos. So airships then had a number, number of obvious advantages. They had, had long range. Uh, they could stay up, up for days at a time. Uh, obviously, the downside of that is you go, you could go beyond, far beyond the range of any possible rescuers uh, as a downside. Uh, you had a stable platform, so you could do your navigation, you could keep accurate records, you could do science. A lot, a lot of these expeditions at this time, they were all justified by science. You know, there's a scientific value to this. I mean, better people probably know more about whether that's true or not. I have a great deal of suspicions. Uh, but that's what it was justified. So airships played this kind of stable, stable platform, long range, and, and it was a great way to explore. You could even perhaps even land on the ice, although no one quite managed that. That was certainly one of their hopes in the 1920s. You could land on the North Pole and deposit scientists and build a base, perhaps. Uh, and I think this may seem strange to us because airships now, I think, are kind of myth, steampunk, children's stories, uh, Philip Pullman. I know that, you know, all these kind of hype stories you get in the press about airships are coming back. So there's something really bizarre, thinking that at one point in history, people thought future of aviation, or at least part of it, was an airship. But just we just have to remember uh, that during the First World War, airships were a key tool for, for reconnaissance, anti-submarine warfare. They bombed London and uh, and the UK. Uh you know, after the, after the First World War, the R-34 was the first aircraft to fly uh, across to New York and back. Uh, the, the kind of the Hugo Ackner and the Zeppelin flew across in, in 1924 uh, in the, in the ZR-3. The Britain, the British were thinking of building airships to link the comp, its empire. The Americans were as well. Stalin too. So, you know, so it was. It wasn't as normal as it seemed now. So, I mean, yeah, because I, I remember doing a podcast on the British airship, the R101, yeah. maybe, maybe a couple of years ago. And, and actually, kind of this, what we're talking about now, predates the R101 by a few years, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, but let's, okay, let's, 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 we'll leave that for the moment. I want to talk about the practicality of airships for sure. But polar yeah. exploration, I mean, yeah. Already, we were sort of fifteen years on from yeah. reaching the South Pole, weren't we? Yeah. And I know, you know, we've got a, a sort of stable, rocky continent to to explore there, and and the and the North is different. Um, but there's some famous characters involved. So Roll Amundsen yeah. is is the great polar explorer, and he's involved in in airship work as well to try and reach the North, isn't he? Um, but you also have uh, an Italian explorer, yeah. Umberto Nobile. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I talk about the differences between them. Maybe I, I, for Amundsen, he's famous. He's also from Norway, which is cold. Uh, Nobile is from Italy somewhere, yeah. which is lovely. Why on earth would he get into this business? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that's a good question, and I think there's probably at times he wondered why he was doing this as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I mean, I mean, the, I mean, the old joke I always make is, is they're polar opposites, isn't it? I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, so Amundsen is kind of. I, I, you could say achieve more in one life than perhaps we would achieve in many lives if we had many lives. Uh, I mean, first in the Northwest Passage, people often forget that. 1905, obviously in the North Pole, 1911, he'd been also become an aviation pioneer, which is often totally off the radar. I mean, he had a really long life. And he's one of these characters like, you know, uh, like Richard Bird, who also goes goes to the South Pole. And they're, and they're multi-generational lives almost. And you can't... Can't believe they're still in the game so many years later. Let's see. Okay, yeah, he, he he was known as the chief. He had a certain leadership style. So if you want to talk about the differences between the two, his leadership style was was kind of fairly dictatorial. Took no took no prisoners. You had to do what he said uh, because he believed that was the best way to survive in these kind of extreme conditions. Any dissent, any discussion, you know, you're risking everyone's life. Uh, he was even Asian pioneer, as we said. He, he saw its potential, but not necessarily understood the technology. I think that's a key thing as well. Uh, and, and he understood the hero business. He was a man of contradictions. He understood the hero business, had to make money, but he also was very good at spending it. So he was always in, always bankrupt. So by the time we get to this kind of mid-1920s, he, you know, he was on the edge of bankruptcy as always, but he was really getting, he was getting it long in the tooth 
he knew he didn't have much of an email expeditions in front of him. And really, he was looking for his kind of last big paycheck before he could retire. And he started to fixate on flying to the North Pole for that reason, I think. So he failed at 23, 24 and 25 uh, to fly. And each time, you know, I suppose the first two were kind of pretty ignorant, pretty disastrous and helped destroy his reputation. 20, 25th, he, on the, in the 925, he landed, well, crash landed a few miles from the from the North Pole. So he's kind of heroic, heroic victor. You know, he came back as a hero. He didn't get to the North Pole, you know, but he kind of is glorious. And they had a fight for survival on the sea ice, and they managed and they managed to escape. So that's brilliant. But the problem was, by that time, other people had come up with a conclusion, come up with the idea we could fly to the North Pole as well. So he had the field to himself for a few years, but now he had competition. And this is where Nobly comes in. He's also very different. So, as you said, Southern Mediterranean, uh, he was married and had a child. And like Amundsen, he had lots of mistresses. So there's very different kind of personalities. Uh, he wasn't an explorer. He'd never been, he'd never been, he'd been skiing, but he'd never been to the Arctic before. Uh, so he, he was not used to those environments. He, what he was was a descendant from aristocracy, which is again very different from Amundsen. Uh, he was a brilliant engineer. He designed airships during the war, sold them as well, become a kind of global figure in the in the, in the industry. So a very different kind of man to Amundsen. But by the two teaming up together meant uh, that Amundsen couldn't be the only person in command anymore. Because nobody had his own men on board, although Norwegians were in majority. The Norwegians made sure that they were in the majority on board. But uh, he depended on nobody and his men. So he straight away he had to split command, which Amundsen didn't really understand, didn't really appreciate, I don't think. So we've got an Italian on board, which clearly then brings us into the rise of fashion, fascism. <laughs> Can't even speak now. Fascism at the time, because Mussolini was on the rise in the early 1920s, of course. Yeah. So does Mussolini take a role in this? Does he fund it? What does Mussolini do for the exploration? I think that's a, that's a brilliant point. I think he, he he's, he's looking to build up, after March in Rome in 20, uh, 22, he's looking to build up the legitimate, the legitimate, legitimate. I'm doing exactly what you do. I think I'm spreading <laughs> this, this issue amongst all of us. Lockie, you're next. Uh, the, the, he, he's looking out to build support for his regime and and its legitimacy by proving he can modernize Italy. The fascists have this thing about airmen and aviators and planes of all kinds. Uh, I mean, I think the great examples that Hitler used was one of the first people to use. Aircraft to campaign uh, in an, in an election. So there's this real sense of of if we embrace these symbols, the symbols of aviation, symbols of what they call record men who would uh, try and set these records, then we're proving to our people in Italy. But also, I think this is a key point to understanding what happens next. Also, proving to this huge Italian diaspora in in America, in Canada, in South America, you know, and also in Australia, that that we are the regime's support because the ties were very strong between all these kind of communities. So he needed their support as well. So, so, and he saw in nobody's idea, and almost as nobody's flight to the North Pole, really as an opportunity to put this onto the world scale, especially as it was going to America and America. The whole book is really set in America, right? Because America is a huge market. So many Italians li living there. And if you can get onto the front page of the American media, you get onto the front page of the world. So, so yeah, there's really other plan as well. I don't. I think Armitage was a crafty operator. He foxed lots of people in his time, especially Scott, who didn't realise he was going to the South Pole. But I think he'd more than met his match with Mussolini. And there's a great photograph of Mussolini, Nobly, uh, and Armitage all together, with kind of Armitage and obviously Mussolini trying to be mates and Nobly on one side. But I don't think Armitage understood who he was dealing with. Uh, because we've seen Mussolini as a joke now, but he wasn't, you know, at that time at all. All right. So fascist involvement. Um, we're principally talking about an airship called the Italia um, yeah. here. However, that wasn't the the, the first one. It wasn't the yeah. first polar exploration no. uh, uh, launched you know, by airship by this team, uh, which included Nobile, I suppose. And uh, we had the Norge as well. Yeah, that's right. Um, how? How did that get going? It's a little bit earlier, isn't it? It was a little bit uh, earlier. Uh, basically, as I said before, in 1925, Armisen 
got near to the North Pole, I think within 100 miles, kind of crashed, crash landed, depends how you want to describe it. The Norwegian museums describe it one way, other other writers describe it another way. Uh, and they had this battle of survival, and they made it with the skin of their teeth. You know, when the last managed to assemble the plane out of the two planes they had, they could manage to just about take off from this runway, which took them three weeks to build, cut out of the ice, and the ice was moving all the time. Incredible story of endurance. And, the, and Armisen was said to have aged dramatically. And this is a man who loved this kind of stuff. I think he got back from that and went, bloody hell, I'm not doing that again. We need an airship. And nobody was the only person in Europe really had an airship. There were all these other projects going on. Uh, Hugo Etna was a rival, but because of reparations, he couldn't, he wasn't allowed to build an airship, a Zeppelin, unless all the other allied countries agreed to it. So really, uh, it was it was nobody with this airship, which was built to be a yacht really for the Italian king to sail around his empire in the Mediterranean, because by then they conquered Libya. Uh, so it even had, at the time, just before the expedition, it even had a throne on board, uh, which was utterly crazy. So it was a luxury air yacht, so you had, so had to strip all this out and convert this into, uh, into an airship for the North Pole that could survive in the North Pole. I mean, it was a, it was a huge machine, as big as something like a 747 or A380. I don't want to get into any angry posts on, on, on Twitter about which is the right comparison, but it was big, but it was small compared to the airships you were talking about, like the R101. So it's probably about a third of the size or something like that R101 would be. So it's kind of big, but small. So it's going to have a tough mission really to, to achieve this. Uh, and and it does this dogleg route through Europe to kind of conserve fuel, to uh, kind of be gentle on the airframe, and it kind of flies actually over Britain to put them in North, in the kind of Norfolk, which is like the uh, Cape Canaveral of the day. And there's wonderful footage, archival footage on YouTube, and if you come to see one of my talks about this, you'll see the footage as well. But flying over England, and there's a kind of Pathé news plane flying alongside it. It looked like it happened, you know, just yesterday. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so it gets up there, uh, and Almaton joins them there at the North Pole. There's lots of skullduggery, you know, about there's already tensions between Norwegians and the Italians, between what the fascists want and, and, and what the Norwegians want. And there are plans perhaps to get rid of all the Italians on board the airship and place them with Norwegians and some English, because the English were not as good as Norwegians, but almost as good. And uh, I mean, this is, you know, they had, they, it was in 1920, so you had this hierarchy of who you thought was better than who. Uh, and so there's some quite unpleasant undertones in some of these conversations. Uh, and But they sensibly decided to go with the Italians and go with Nobly. And so they set off. And it was quite amazing at, at the trip. On May the 12th, they reached kind of uh, the North Pole. And you could argue perhaps they were the first people to ever definitely fly to reach the North Pole. Cook and Perry had gone before, but there were some doubts, depending on, uh, you know, varying degrees of doubt about whether they made it. Uh, Richard Bird flew either about a week or so, a few days before and claimed to reach the North Pole, but his calculations are are in doubt. Many people don't think he arrived there. Uh, his notes were terrible. This is why we came back to notes. People looked at his notes very quickly after that. No one can make any sense hard to make any sense of his calculation. So they, they think he kind of missed the North Pole. So there's a good chance they were the first people to ever reach the North Pole. And then they flew on into Alaska. So they were the first aircraft ever to fly from Norway over the North Pole into Alaska, uh, which is now kind of was one of the famous kind of routes of the world, the polar route. Uh, they, they couldn't quite get to know where they wanted to land because there was like kind of a, an airship mast and these ships are huge so you need an airship mast to tie them up to stop them being blown around by the wind ideally a hangar but these are vast structures as well they landed about 72 miles short the weather was terrible they were exhausted and you, and you can say that they crashed or you can say it was a controlled a, a controlled deflation but the problem with the airship is when you land uh it wants to float off. So if everyone starts getting off, it will want to float off again. And you need about 100 people perhaps to tie it down. So they didn't have anyone there. So they jumped up very quickly and, emerged and deflated it very, very quickly. So it became a crumpled heap on the ground. So it's an amazing expedition. Uh, Triumph to the New York Times, four pages. 
uh, front page story, one of the greatest achievements of the world. And obviously the weird thing is it's now totally forgotten. I've got to say, you, you want an almost as good over the best option, right? Almost is just as good. Yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, so Mussolini can't keep his nose out of this, of course, because it's Mussolini, yeah. and he has to have his fingers in all the pies, including invading bloody everyone and having literally the world at his, fingers, at his fingertips. Yeah. So he's how involved is he getting in these plans? How much is he sticking his nose into it? Well, I think in, the ni- in 1926, he... he facilitated it he helped negotiate the, the deal over the airship with Amundsen uh and he was very much in the background the message was really kind of you know you have to to nobody he has to succeed so this is a tension between the two Amundsen is a kind of gentleman explorer almost in a way you know if it crashes and they walk out over the ice and they're heroic failures that's great but obviously nobody has to succeed the flight has to work for him I think that's made patently clear Mussolini protects him to some extent from uh, there's lots of politics in Italy at the time. Airship politics are the worst kind of politics. Uh, lots of backbiting. Uh, and eventually we're trying to have a go at him. And Mussolini kind of protects him as well from this kind of fighting. And uh, I think his real, the real message really comes, the real involvement really comes at the end when he gets to America. Uh, because it's really then about, okay, you've got to promote the fascist regime. You've got to, you know, you've got to claim credit for this, flight i mean i I mean i think you could argue whether nobody was happy to do that not happy to do that but certainly that was the message and and the league of uh wonderful organization if you like if you like uh man in the high castle which is on amazon they're going to feel this is very much man in high castle territory fascist league of north america organized huge amounts of popular support for nobody as he arrived his men there this triumphant tour across america when they got to new york and Grand central station I mean, this is real man in high castle territory. They were met by Italian, hundreds of Italians in black shirts in the middle of New York. And there was almost a riot at the at the railway station. The New York police lost control. So this real sense of this alternate reality, uh, you know, and uh, Amundsen was obviously totally outmaneuvered by this because the Norwegian diaspora is quite small. He was, by this stage, he'd been, he'd been on the block, as we were saying, for quite a long time. You know, you know yeah, oh, it's Amundsen again. But nobody was young, handsome, charismatic. The aviator was the hero, was the astronaut of the day. And he not only built this plane, this airship, he actually flew it as well. So, uh, and the papers started calling him things like the the new Columbus before Columbus obviously was a problematic uh, figure. So he was seen as this massive hero and Armisen uh, went off home. And that was really down to Mussolini pressure. I think nobody was put under by Mussolini. Uh, although there's one great story of his dog, he always had this dog, Titania, and there's a great kind of cartoon, Norwegian, Danish, uh, Dutch cartoon about this out at the moment. And he weed on the White House carpet floor because he got to meet the Calvin Coolidge, the president, and his dog weed on the floor of the White House. So a, lo- a little bit of light amusement. Uh, in the, uh, Coolidge was a dog owner, I think, so he didn't mind. Uh, uh, this kind of thing you get used to, I guess. But um, So that was quite an amusing thing. But yeah, he was really involved in that. When he got back to Italy, he was a hero. And nobody did really well. I mean, it's hard to, you can't really avoid that issue. He did really well at this financially in terms of his, he got, became a general, his profile. But I think at that point, Mussolini started to step back a bit because when, when nobody came up with this idea of going back to the North Pole in the Italia, I think that there's a couple of great quotes uh, from, from Mussolini. Uh, uh, perhaps it would be better not to tempt fate a second time. That was Mussolini's attitude to the second flight. You know, well, we've got all this fame, we've improved this point, we've proved the mission, we've done it, we've proved Italy is modern. There's lots of other record men setting other flights, doing other flights with Italy around the world. So don't go back, basically. But nobody was in... Well, uh, I think there's something about the North Pole that obsesses people, like Amundsen or the other explorers. And suddenly I, I went up Svalbard, up to the Arctic Circle to do some research for my book. For months afterwards, all I could think about it, all I could think about was the Arctic and wanting to return. So there's something that grips men's soul. I think nobody was determined to go back because he wanted to prove he could do it without Amundsen. Uh, he want, I think he wanted to escape the politics of fascist Italy. I mean, uh, it was vicious uh, as well. So uh, so Mussolini was stepping back, and this new figure was rising, really, called Italia Balbo, who we've never 
who totally we haven't really heard of. People in the aviation world may have heard of him. Uh, is a famous aviator, became a famous aviator. He was one of the founders of the fascist party. Uh, one of the, uh, so a pretty kind of tough guy. He's a glamorous figure. He loved this. He was on the cover of Time magazine. He wanted to look like a Hollywood idol. But, you know, you don't become one of the founders of the fascist party by being, not, being a nice guy. He's a street fighter, mean street fighter, tough, very ruthless. Uh, and he didn't like nobody at all. Tensions have been building up between the two men uh, for a while. I think Blavo wanted to, to modernise the Italian Air Force, and it's, we've just had, I think, the 100th anniversary of the Italian Air Force. He's seen as kind of one of the main founders. He wanted to modernise it, and he didn't see there any role for airships in it, and especially these kind of uh, prima donnas, as he called men like Nobly, which is ironic, because he was a real prima donna himself. So... Uh, and he he was getting in between Mussolini and Nobly. And after this meeting, when no, Nobly told Mussolini he wanted to go back to the North Pole, and Mussolini said, are you sure you really want to? This is a, it's probably bad to risk this again. Apparently, Nobly left the room, and Balbo turned to Mussolini and said, let him go, for he cannot possibly come back to bother us anymore. So Balbo certainly saw this as an opportunity to get rid of this guy, because there's no way he's going to come back from from a second trip to the North Pole, his luck's not going to run. And also, perhaps I'll try and make sure it doesn't really work out for him. So rather than sending seaplanes to help in case that his airship crashes, we won't send any seaplanes at all. We'll just send some we'll just send some special special forces who are not really trained in Arctic conditions. But we'll send them, but we won't send any real support for him. There's a slight spoiler alert in that because then this is what we were going to go on to was how does oh. the flight of the Italian? Oh, sorry, well, I don't know. Oh my God, spoiler! Uh... <laughs> oh, do, you, do you know what my, my first thing was going to be? It's rare to hear about Mussolini. This might be a history hack first, actually, uh, about Mussolini being the voice of reason and pragmatism. <laughs> <Yes>. uh, <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm glad I've set some record. Uh, I've set a record here. Yeah. Yeah. Go on then. How, how does it go then? The Italia. Um, the, yeah, yeah. I, I, the mean, I, I mean, I think well, the Italian is like the Norge. I mean, he doesn't get the opportunity. Uh, uh, we, he doesn't get the opportunity to build a new airship, which he wanted to, because Balbo kind of saw to that. Uh, so he said he goes back and basically exactly the same kind of airship. Uh, even more ambitious though, because the stakes have changed. I mean, the this is all driven by the media. A lot of this funded by the media. We talked about Pathé News. We talked about the New York Times. Uh. Barbo made sure the Italians wouldn't give any the Italian state wouldn't give them any money for this return trip. So it had to be funded basically from media, selling media deals, exclusive deals. And they had a tariff of if you achieve this, you get this much money. If you get achieve this, you get this much money. And uh, you know, and there's even one goodness knows what will happen to this expedition, uh, but there's even one uh that says if you disappear off radio contact for three days and then reappear, you'll get this even more money. So he's under pressure. He, nobody's under pressure, not just to succeed, but also to do these things to add, earn more money from the media companies that who are kind of sponsoring him. Uh, so the plane is exactly the same. Uh, and he knows there's lots of pressure on him, but he does it, he gives us a really kind of powerful speech, if I kind of uh, allowed to say. He, on, the, he, on the evening of his departure from Milan, he flies from Rome to Milan, who are basically... The citizens of Milan are quite independent, so they're pay, helping to pay for all this as well. So he goes to goes to Milan, he gives a speech. We're quite aware that our venture is difficult and dangerous, even more so than 1926. But it is this very difficulty and danger which attracts us. Had it been safe and easy, other people would have already preceded us. So, But if our enterprise should be wrecked, then you will see all these facile critics come forward, leaping for joy to tell you that they had foreseen it, that things could have been otherwise. That was only that natural that this could happen. So there's a real sense of kind of the kind of right stuff, NASA, Apollo there, but a sense of kind of foreshadowing what might, what he fears might happen. Uh, so, so they get to the North Pole. Uh, rather than taking this kind of dog leg, dog leg trip his, he made in 1926, nobody went straight over Europe, la stopped in North Germany, and then carried on. Very demanding trip for a small airship, but he's a small airship. Uh, got damaged a bit and he had to wait for it to be repaired, but he knew he couldn't go ever he couldn't go back to Rome for repairs because if he went back to Rome, it's probably never he was never going to be allowed uh, to leave again by Balbo. So he had to keep going on. 
got to got to the got to the North Pole, to Svalbard, uh, which is where all this action takes place. Uh, and and then he does he makes two flights before he goes to the North Pole. And then the North Pole flight is the easiest flight of these. So the first flight he wants to. Uh, there've been so many of these kind of record breaking flights that you have to up the ante. You can't just do one flight. You have to do multiple flights. You have to do something spectacular. So he wants to fly along the Siberian coast into kind of the Arctic wasteland. And this way, first time he does it, he has to turn back between the, before because of bad weather. Second time he does it, he achieves this amazing flight, longer than his flight to Alaska. So, uh, and the key thing, the amazing thing he does, he goes all the way along the Siberian coast, discover new lands, maps places that haven't been seen before, uh, or the interior hasn't been discovered before. And then he comes around the big circle exactly to where he left. And now, in terms of navigation in 1926, that was kind of, sort of 28, that's quite an amazing achievement. Come back exactly the same point. Because when he flew to Alaska, when he flew to Alaska, he didn't have to, well, it didn't really matter too much where he landed. He could just go, I'm going to land in Alaska, hooray, you know. Whereas now he got all the way back to exactly the same point, which is an amazing achievement. And and, uh, and the Norwegian, uh, so we're talking about a flight of a couple of thousand miles. So the Norwegian journalists, who weren't very kind to the Italians usually, especially their ability to, to ski or the ability to cope in the, the ice and snow, uh, actually recognised this was an amazing achievement and that the Italians had done this without any Norwegian help. So that's now all forgotten because of what happens next. So the flight to the North Pole should be the easiest flight. So on the on May the 22nd, they leave Kings Bay and Svalbard, which is an island 500 miles south of, of the North Pole, reach the North Pole again. So it's an amazing achievement. So nobody second flies to the North Pole for the second time. Uh, amazing, quite an amazing achievement. They drop their flag. They toast Mussolini. They play a gramophone record, sing fascist hymns. It helps as a fascist journalist on board. So uh, for Mussolini's paper, so they, you know, they have to do all the right things. And then they turn back. Now, uh, nobody had a choice. Did he kind of fly on? Because the weather had been, well, the wind had been blowing them all the way there, but that meant that if you turned back around, you were going to face the wind and perhaps even worse conditions. So nobody had a choice to go to Alaska, perhaps fly the big route round, a bit like he did before, and come back kind of via Siberia, a huge journey, but we've missed, missed the bad weather. Or do you just go back into the bad weather thinking, well, no, it can't be that bad, surely. He listens to his navigator called Malgrim, and he decides to go back the way he came, which turns into a massive mistake. Because the weather conditions have worsened, the wind is stronger. So there's periods when the airship is barely moving forward because the wind is so strong, and then they disappear. And no one, no one knows what's happened to them. A radio communication is lost. They know the rough area. Uh, perhaps they've disappeared, or there's some disagreement where, where, you know, exactly where that is. Uh, and in the early morning of May the 25th, 1928, they basically crash onto the sea ice and and a strange kind of crash so i thought it was just like an airplane crash straight into the ice but actually they kind of come down tail first so the cabin uh the cabin is ripped off a bit of the some of the engines are as well but the airship envelope floats away so that leaves the half the men on the ice you know total in shock and the other half actually in the envelope itself and they can see below, and there's stories of the men appearing below through the hole in the airship as they float off. There's no engines anymore. There's no method of controlling it. Uh, and they're never, ever seen again. And the, and no wreckage is ever found. Uh, so they totally disappear. So perhaps with global warming, you know, their wreckage may, may be found. So that's where that's what happens. Chris is actually really annoyed that I... He's not here to ask this question because he's like okay. some sort of weirdo on the Franklin expedition. But the next stage of this is there is a huge, huge surge, and it is the largest Arctic surge and the rescue mission since the Franklin mm. expedition. Mm. What happens during this expedition? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think the comparison of Franklin expedition is good. Uh, I actually got an email from the editor of the Economist saying, "How is one well, of the deputy editor of the Economist? How is this?" Uh, different from search for Franklin. Surely, Franklin expedition was the biggest search. Now, I don't want to get into. Uh, I don't want to get into uh, kind of some social media war with people, but I, I, I think you could probably argue that this was the largest search in history in terms of over short period of time. 
the, the Franklin searches for Franklin went on for for a number of years, as far as I understand. So, uh, I mean, you could argue, what do you mean by these terms? But I would say, because it only lasted a couple of months, it was probably the biggest. But Franklin search lasted for years, so I don't know. Uh, I don't know whether that's helpful. <laughs> but I thought I'd, I, I, I thought I'd throw that in as an issue of. Uh, that's why I argue. That's why the book says the largest search in history, because I think it is bigger on that criteria than Franklin's expedition. I hope mm-hmm. Chris won't hate me for that. No, it's fine. You're always going to get involved in some sort of Twitter spat with somebody because somebody's not going to like the way you said it. So either way, or you could say everything as perfect as it, as it is and yeah. someone's still going to find an issue with it. Am is I that... right, Lockie? <laughs> <laughs> you gave us a thumbs up. Okay, great. <laughs> German counterattacks and Twitter spats are the things in life you can be sure of, I think. <laughs> That's a great line. But that, that is a brilliant line. Uh, so, yeah, so, so the search for... Search for Nobly is a big search. I think we can uh, we can probably agree with that. Uh, and it ends up with, a, you know, I suppose this one. If you like your Marvel movies, I love Mar- I love Marvel. That maybe mean that like, I get cut from this podcast straight away. But uh, there's one for a moment. On a day after they've disappeared, all the world's top explorers. I mean, it's just like steampunk Marvel kind of moment. Or oh, we're having dinner in this Norwegian restaurant. Celebrating chief some other aviators who'd kind of flown across from Alaska, but kind of hopped across rather than in one go. Uh, uh, and uh, suddenly the door the door swings open and the kind of a messenger rushes in saying the Italia has disappeared. No one knows what's happened to Taylor, lost contact, and the room goes quiet. Uh, and everyone turns to Armisen. And this is one because they know that Armisen and Nobly hated each other. It's a very public fight in America in the press. Armisen had even written a book about it, which it was kind of book uh, that you should never write, and sort of should never have published. So they everyone knew they hated each other. So what was Armisen going to do? As as one someone said, there was no d- diner there who didn't remember the bitter public quarrel between the two men. Uh, and then he turns up. He has no choice really. He gets up and says, "Tell them." I'm ready. Uh, you know, so it's this wonderful dramatic moment. And that that promise though is going to have awful consequences for Almerson uh, later. Uh, so the rescue mission gets going. Uh, they kind of have to wait for, to hear what Mussolini wants to do, but they get going straight away. Uh, and so by the kind of, within a few days, I suppose it, probably about over a week or so, the first aircraft start to reach Salvard, 500 miles north, so 500 miles south of of the North Pole. These are very primitive aircraft, uh, kind of World War One types, kind of float planes, monoplanes, with struts and wires, not very reliable. And they start the search. Uh, and the first aircraft actually disappears. So quickly the expedition becomes, uh, quickly rescuers have to try and find the first aircraft uh, before they can look for nobly. Uh, so that's what that's, that all starts. Uh, and then gradually this bigger mar- air armada begin with, with countries from with planes from flying boats, sea planes and float planes from Denmark, Finland, France, Italy, Norway, Soviet Union, Sweden, and the United States. They all gradually converge on northern Norway, a place called Tromsø, which is an amazing city in in the kind of in, in the kind of fjords for the hop across the Svalbard. The float planes had to be hauled onto ships to be t- taken across because they didn't have enough range. The big flying boats could make it by themselves, or they also would often fly together for safety. And that was all sudden to get together around this time uh, and to head over there. And including the Italians, I mean, Mussolini in the meantime had said, yeah, you can try and rescue nobly, but you know, we're not really going to help that much because we kind of preferred that if he kind of died a martyr rather than actually wanting to rescue him. And it's a bit embarrassing for the fat fascist super, super breed to be in this mess. Uh, so, and but we, we hate Amundsen for what he said about nobody, so he can't have anything to do with this. So Amundsen sidelined straight away from this expedition, and it's, it's fairly chaotic because Italians don't really want to take responsibility. But some Italian businessmen shamed Mussolini into doing this. So one of their aces, Maddalena, in a state-of-the-art aircraft, the Italians were producing an amazing aircraft at the time, does fly to Kings Bay because they were shamed into into actually being forced to help help nobody. But that all that all brings together, comes together, 
uh, especially between the June 6th, June 18th, 1928, gets very busy. And then Armisen obviously has a problem. He said he's going to come to help. Nobody doesn't want him involved. Risa Larson is another figure who used to be his right hand man. He's now leading the rescue mission, doesn't want Armisen involved because he's, he's going to be the hero now. The Norwegian government doesn't really want Armisen involved, you could probably say. Uh, but he has to be the hero for his media, for his brand. So he manages to find an aircraft from the French called the Latham, experimental aircraft. But the poor crew have to go along with it, even though it turns out later they have lots of doubts about the airworthiness of this aircraft. It's underpowered. It's made out of wood, really. So it's not really ideal for the Arctic conditions. Certainly it can't land anywhere because it'd be crushed and destroyed by the ice. So anyway, he joins the expedition. He arrives there about the 18th of June. And at this point, the, the, they know that they heard it, the well, perhaps we'll talk about that later. But 18th of June, they're on the, the, their Armisen sets off, refuses to fly with anyone else, uh, e even for safety, because that's that's his kind of signature. He doesn't want to tell what anyone what else he's doing, he wants to do it alone, outmaneuver uh, perhaps his, his rivals. But this obviously leads to disaster because he disappears on that evening of June the 18th, never seen again, uh, no one knows. What's happened to him? It takes days for people to realise there's a problem because he keeps everything to himself. Has he disappeared? Has he just gone looks rogue to look for nobody himself? No one knows. And this is obviously a problem that happened in the past with him. And he comes out triumphantly as well. This is also a stunt kind of strategy he's used before. So, no, so it takes a few days for people to start getting worried and start searching for him. So that's that starts to take over as nobody, as the search of nobody is also growing. So you have this crazy time you've got two missions two search missions going on, one for the people who disappeared and one for some of the people who were trying to rescue him, but who've also disappeared. Well, this all just, it sounds insane, really. But, I mean, while all that's going on, of course, you've got these poor people stuck on... Yeah. I mean, never mind, just the horror of being trapped on an out-of-control airship that's just, that just drifts away, mm. essentially, which is, which is horrific enough, and those people never seen again. But those who did crash onto the ice... I mean, they're there for, for days, aren't they? Mm. Well, what's, what's life like for them there in oh. that time? I, I mean, I think it's kind of, uh, it's pretty brutal. Uh, I mean, first of all, they're in shock. Some of them have been badly injured. Nobody has been quite badly injured himself, and he's convinced that he's going to die. Uh, uh, his dog survived, so that's all right. The dog seems quite happy. He's convinced, he's convinced that he's going to die. Uh, other people have been badly injured as well. Uh, uh, Margram, who was a navigator who, who persuaded him to fly back this way, is severely depressed because he's blaming himself for for this disaster. He tries to take his own life almost immediately after surviving the crash. Uh, one person dies, and they find a mechanic who looks like he's alive, but then they touch him and he falls over and he died. He died in, in the crash too. So it's quite a brutal existence. Re de re debris everywhere. The only good thing is that some of these emergency supplies have survived. Now, there's two different interpretations of what happened. I think uh, that one of the crew member, this was from one of the stories, realised what who was in the envelope, realised what was going to happen and quickly threw out some of the supplies. The last minute ditch, desperate attempt to help his colleagues because he knew his, knew his own fate. Or he could go, well, survive, survive, supplies survived somehow the act, in the accident. Uh, but they've got these uh, these supplies, uh, so they're actually okay for food. Although I don't think they felt that. But when you look at the re how much food they had, they were probably going to be okay. Uh, they didn't feel like that. Uh, but they only had one tenth between them all. So they got, quite a few of them were going to have to sleep out so outdoors, or they're going to have to sleep on. They had a couple of rugs, but they're going to be sleeping basically on the ice. Really badly injured men, really cold conditions, sleeping on the ice traumatized it's pretty pretty horrendous uh they did get a radio going uh, this possible sos radio which somehow survived miraculously survived uh but for ages they could hear the rest of the world searching for them but the rest of the world couldn't didn't hear them uh, uh which must have been agonizing because they could hear them searching in the wrong area they could hear there were a couple of tons of all the residents of today there are people faking it saying Faking broadcasts saying we are the crew of the Italia, 
and getting the rescuers to actually look in the wrong place. So they could hear all this and, and they had no way of communicating. No one seemed to be able to understand them. Uh, and that was also, also causing problems as well then because people were starting to lose heart. The men in his team starting to lose heart. Armisen, and if you want, it, it's quite interesting how you can compare different leadership styles. Armisen, uh, sorry, nobody may have uh, dismissed the agent, said the age of explorer was over. And now it's the age of the kind of aviator and the engineer. But obviously now suddenly he's back in that situation. This is the time for a man like Amundsen uh, to be there. But of course, there isn't anyone really of that experience. And he loses confidence in his own judgment. So he starts to lose control of the team. Uh, and three people decide to, uh, three, three men decide to kind of try and walk across the sea ice to, to safety. Because... The weird thing is, you can see bit the islands are here and there, which are obviously hard land. So they, you know, uh, so they had the idea they could walk across the sea ice to one of these islands, regroup. And either someone would see them, or they then could walk across, try and get to Svalbard, and probably which is actually quite close. And so they, he, he can't stop them going, uh, and he manages to stop a load of people going, but few few people do go, uh, and you can't stop that. So it's pretty, and he and he talks about his depression because he's surrounded by the debris of his command everywhere. So they eventually moved somewhere else. Uh, and also another thing you mentioned about the sea ice is, is that they're hearing every night the creaks and cracks of sea ice under them. So they never know whether they're actually going to be suddenly plunged, you know, you know, into the water. So it's a very unnerving, very unnerving time. Uh, so yeah, and 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 when the when they first discovered, so it's June twentieth. So just under a month since since they crashed. That's a long time to be out in the open in the Arctic. I went to Svalbard. I spent probably 10 minutes in, on the glacier in, in, in the evening with the wind blowing. And despite all the modern tech clothes you're wearing, bloody hell, that was cold. You know, and, and so imagine what that would be like you know, for weeks and weeks. It's, it's under, it, hard to believe. Uh, so, so, yeah, so they eventually discovered on the 20th. Uh, and then by Madeleine, the Italian guy, which is great, so nice story. And then the supplies eventually dropped on them again for them. Uh, kind of misses to begin with, and then they work out how you actually manage to land supplies from a plane. But when the plane comes back, they actually have a camera crew in the, on the back of the plane to film them. Uh, and, and, and nobly describes the shame he feels, that they're in this terrible mess. Everyone's dirty, stomach, disgusting, badly injured. And they're being filmed uh, by a plane, so because you know, it's great footage, and you're going to make a lot of money. And what was really funny when I was researching this book, there's this, there's a picture in, in some of the libraries and the photo libraries that is used to. This is a photo of the camp. And you look at the you look at the photo, you go, that looks like a model to me. And actually, the current thinking is a rival newsreel company who couldn't get the rights to the footage faked uh, faked this, built a model. And kind of went around filming it and did some shadows and lighting to apply the shadows. So that's the current thinking about it because this had become a big story. I mean, wasn't when he set off? You no, know, he was making front page of the New York Times because nobody was a big character by then. But kind of that's bottom left rather than top. By the time of the crash, it's kind of head, headline headline news, and everyone everyone wants to know. Uh, everyone wants to know what's going on. So that's kind of yeah, that's interesting. How many people actually end up surviving? Eight. Wow. And so, yeah, so, so that none of the crew, none of the crew, uh, none of the people who fly away survive. Uh, one of the uh, crew died. One of the other guys died on the crash, as I said. And then, well, I, I don't want to spoil anything else, but the fate of another person. So, and another person's fate is mysterious, uncertain. Okay, so there is a rescue eventually. What? was the legacy of the attempt and, and what, what effect did it have on Nobile afterwards? That's a brilliant question. Uh, uh, Nobly doesn't realise when he's out there his, his government has been spreading lies about him. Uh, because there's various things that happen you have to read the book to discover why but they've been spreading lies, lies about him because he was the first to be rescued uh, and he doesn't realise any of this until he gets, gets back her, on his way home and he sees the paper so he's being attacked all the time in, in his Italian media when they get to 
uh, and Tronzo, or all the survivors, they get to Tronzo, and they're met with a mob who are talking about, you know, hanging him, killing nobody. Because Armisen is dead, or disappeared, the hero, uh, and, and somehow nobody is still alive. And that seemed very wrong to many Norwegians. So they weren't allowed to set, even set foot on Norwegian soil when they got back. And they had to walk across a plank into a train carriage, which would take them back to, back to Italy. Uh, so, uh, and, and as they went through Europe, they got met with different kind of, if it was a Catholic country, people tended to be more friendly. If it was Protestant, they tended to hate them. Uh, it was a very odd experience. And then when the train carriage was being compared to Newspapers at the time compared it to Lenin's carriage that took him back to Russia. It's not quite like that. They were just warned not to go, not to wander around the train because you don't know who else is going to be on board and you know, people may say things. So they were kind of restricted to coach, but they weren't imprisoned in that coach. Uh, so, so he had he had a total shock and was traumatized and was furious. And he also he was suffering from PTSD from his, you know, it must have been incredibly brutal experience he must have been through. So he got back to Italy. The Italians saw him as a hero, much to Mussolini and the Barbo wanted to dampen down any celebrations. These people survived, they weren't supposed to survive. You know, they're supposed to either succeed or die. This is the worst possible outcome. But the Italians saw him as a hero. Hundreds of thousands of people supported him. So they had to, they were going to have to accommodate him. But then nobody, because of his trauma, because of his anger, uh, it, it, he misjudges this situation mishandles it so he then becomes an enemy of the regime he has a fight with Mussolini very few people can I suppose survive a fight with Mussolini he has a blazing row with Mussolini and becomes an enemy of the regime and becomes uh uh so he goes into exile and yeah well he goes to Russia for a while works for Uncle Stalin Uncle Joe Stalin trying to build his airships and then goes into exile into America comes back in the last you know he is a patriot so he did, does come back to Italy in the end uh but the upside of all this is that when after after the war he's seen as a hero, uh, and uh, he gets uh, he gets rehabilitated by the new Italian government, and he gets all his back pay because he resigned his commission after his fight with Mussolini. So he gets loads of back pay, and he ends up a very wealthy man. So that's one of the bizarre things about this. It actually ends up a very wealthy man. That means his story isn't forgotten either. No one remembers the success of twenty six, but every but people remember for a long time the, the, the disaster of 1928. So he remains a hero. He becomes a you know a figure that people remember rather than just disappearing into obscurity. Uh, I guess other other implications are when Hugo Etna tries to fly to the North Pole, wants to fly his Zeppelin to the North Pole in 30 because he hates nobody, thinks nobody's a joke, and and then he, and he was going to show that German technology can do it instead, professionalism. The insurance companies go, no, 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 you're not flying to the North Pole in a Zeppelin, in an airship. No, you can fly around the Arctic, but you can't fly to the North Pole. So, so he doesn't get to, uh, you know, he he doesn't get get to repeat that flight either. And I, and I suppose broader pattern is one of these flights that helps perhaps discredit airships as a form of transportation, as big list. And it's not a big one, but it got lots of he headlines. Uh, you know, so even though there was a classic airship story, it was a successful flight, but everyone remembers the, the, the really the unsuccessful flight. So I guess it helps to discredit that. But there's lots of echoes today, isn't it, about pushing technology to the limits, big egos, politics, how quickly these kind of policies, these kind of things get wrapped up in nationalism, like SpaceX, you know, Elon Musk. I mean, there's lots of kind of these echoes, uh, I think, today. I don't know what the lesson is. But certainly, this this is this is kind of precursor precursor to those things. Mark, this has been absolutely amazing. I've been so captivated by the story. I didn't even know it existed till you Brilliant. come on board <laughs> and, and spoke about it. No, it's great, and I'm hoping our listeners will go out and get your book because I'm stunned that people can be so. Actually, no, I'm not stunned. I'm lying. People are so arrogant and such jackasses and such wankers. And there's so much at that time to be able to explore and see and do. Yet you're being stopped and mocked and laughed at by various different people. But never mind. Anyway, please remind our listeners the name of your book. Uh, it's uh, called N4 Down, The Hunt for the Arctic Airship Italia. And it's published by 
I think now at Mariner Books, part of, part of HarperCollins. Fabulous. We will get your book into our bookshop. We will not be promoting it because of that uh, rainforest. Chris always does this better, but that rainforest website, and we don't want to get sued so that we don't actually say the name of that place. So you get a cut of it, we get a cut of it, and local bookshops are supported rather than Just that big yeah. billion corporation. So <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much again for joining us. Well, thank you for having me on. on it's, it's great to be on one of my favourite podcasts. So. Thank you. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section thank you so much for your continued support we really appreciate our listeners and supporters so make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book